lunch hour. Um, SPI, which I'm running, is something that I started really in response to my own field work and an inherent belief that many of the paradigms discussed for preservation were A, ineffective, and B, uh, hyper-theoretical, and I hope to lay out some of those issues for you during this talk today and talk about why we at SPI feel, at least for many sites, I may never say for all, that this kind of a paradigm is, if not the only one, one of the few that actually has an efficacious chance of both preserving cultural heritage, but equally importantly, helping those people who live around archaeological sites for whom today archaeology is at best an economic neutral and more frequently an economic firm uh, through preservation. Um, before I get started, though, let me talk a little bit about some of the terms that I want to use because some of them are things that have gotten thrown around an awful lot in discourse and people in anthropology have heard them. Words like community-based, words like local, words like economic development and sustainability, which is in our title. And it's, I like the fact that it's in the title of our organization because it is so vague and amorphous and I can pretty much use it to mean anything I want to make anything I want to be sustainable. But I actually do have some more specific definitions that I like to do. And part of the reason for this talk is that there are a lot of organizations out there that are claiming to be initiating and implementing projects that utilize these kinds of concepts. So when you actually dig down into them, they provide you some vague anecdotal evidence of what they're doing, and, they're, and they have unsupported claims of the successful application of these notions. And if they disclose any information at all, they yield to find it on many web pages, and I'm not going to call anyone out at this talk. I've done that before, sometimes to my detriment. I am providing these vague missives about economic potential and community benefit, rather than actually taking having any meaningful measures of their results, or even more so, discussing their failures and what doesn't work. If there's one shortcoming in the entire not-for-profit community, it's that if you read everyone's web page, they've never had a single failed project. It's remarkable, I mean, they should be doing something else because it's, there's never been a single failure. And the other thing that I would note about a lot of these projects when you dive into them is whatever their merits may be, they certainly don't seem to be either community-based or economic development or sustainable. Uh, anybody, by the way, who wants copies of these slides, I'm happy to provide them. I think they're also here, so if you don't have to scribble down small, you know, all this little thing that I put up there. But I, so I want to talk about what constitutes community-based sustainable economic development and discuss its application and preservation. I'm then going to try to discuss what I think are some metrics of project success, how you can measure them both economically and from a preservation perspective. And while I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the merits of bottom-up versus top-down paradigm, there's some literature on that, particularly the work of Eleanor Oster, which I think demonstrates fairly strongly that community-based, bottom-up approaches work best. Uh, and I'm a very strong proponent of that. But I want to then go into an actual case study with results, tell you some of the things that didn't work well and how we're responding to those in order to give you a sense of what we're doing. So let me start by, what do I mean by a community? Uh, those of you who are anthropologists have no doubt read Benedict Anderson and imagined communities, and there are all kinds of definitions. Mine is a pretty simple one. It's those who are residing in the vicinity of a cultural heritage asset, and I do call them assets because we're going to have an economic development discussion, who have the potential to be affected by economic development there. What do I mean by uh, community? I'm uh, sorry. And what do I mean by community-based economic development? That means that the economic development must include local economic benefits. Plain and simple. If you bring a tourist from New York City down here, take them, walk them around the Penn campus, and they drive back to New York, and they don't spend a dollar where they're here, that's economic development. But that is not locally based economic development because not a single dollar has been spent here. Now, I know Julian would never let that happen with respect to the museum. But I mean, most people who visited archaeological sites have seen tourists come in. There's a bus of tourists that come from the larger city. They come, they walk around the site, they bring their own guide, and they leave. That's not uh, economic development that's local at all. 
And ideally, community-based development will also include a strong element of local control as to the nature and scale of economic development, again, a bottom-up approach. Uh, Eleanor Oshman won a Nobel Prize in, I believe, 2009 or 2010 by demonstrating that bottom-up, locally formulated solutions to these kinds of resource exploitation issues, and these are resource exploitation issues because archaeological sites can be used for a lot of things that have nothing to do with archaeology. Ancient people frequently built their sites in places that are awfully nice, that are very farmable, that are very grazable. They've got big stones that work incredibly well to repair your house, or it's a nice little hill or mound on top of which you can build a new house and have one pretty spectacular view. And we don't like to think of them as anthropologists and archaeologists as assets, as, as exploitable resources, but sadly in the real world that they are. Uh, economic development. I think everyone kind of knows what it means. Here's a definition that I use, but it's really creating conditions for economic growth, for employment generation, and for revenue generation. Without those three things, it can be all kinds of programs, but it is not economic development. Then I add to those two other goals. One is you can't, in kinds of economic development that we're willing to contemplate. The first of these is it can't destroy or materially diminish cultural heritage. And ideally, it will provide economic and social incentives to preserve it. And that's when we're looking to have a sustainability of cultural development. Those are the kinds of economic developments that we feel Provide, that's utilizing really your heritage asset in a non-destructive way in order to create revenue. Does that mean that it's going to remain pristine and not touched? Probably not, but I would argue that no asset remains pristine or untouched and through the passage of time if you look at it. It's not as if the choice is we show up, do something or don't something, or the asset remains in a bubble, it never does. Um, so let me turn a bit, before I get into this, to what I mean by sustainability. Now, some of you who've studied sustainability know that, as I said, it has lots of meaning and, use, and uses in both cultural heritage and elsewhere. It's usually used as part of explaining a concept uh, in, in terms of this sustainable preservation, sustainable development, or sustainable tourism. These concepts are overlapped and intertwined. And it really grows out of a UN commission called the Brundtland Commission from 1987, which was called Our Common Future. And it defines sustainable development as, and I quote, development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. A vaguer definition I would have a harder time coming up with. But I think it's what it's trying to bring attention to is the problems of over-exploitation of assets currently, and really the damage of natural, you know, to natural resources and cultural resources in the pursuit of economic development. And really it's calling for a practice of thinking about economic development that better utilizes and leaves adequate resources for future generations. That's cleaner, that's more efficient. And I don't think the definition really can say a whole lot more than that because obviously as you have technological and human advance or digression, the rate at which resources are used and utilized and how they're utilized changes over time. I mean, just think about things like the personal computer, which 20 years wasn't even part of our resource calculation, what it means for electricity, what it means for mining, what it means for material, what it means for shipping. So these changes are very dramatic, and so sustainability is really an extraordinarily dynamic, dynamic concept. Now, I note that the Brundtland Commission uh, definition of sustainability also included social and economic responsibility as important components of sustainable development. Though I find in many subsequent discussions these components play a very secondary role to the environmental one. And I want to try to bring that notion of sustainability, the notion of people, back to the forefront. And some projects in cultural heritage are concerned with this kinds of environmental sustainability, the reuse of uh, historical property and well, changing over to solar or heating or more efficient heating methods, etc. And so they are considering the aspects of that, but fewer and fewer are really bringing in the economic and social one, which is a powerful consideration of local people and their rights. So when we talk about uh, what are we competing against economically, 
people say, oh, looting, it's expensive, people pay millions of dollars for these pieces. And this, this graph shows, and it's from Elizabeth Gilgan's doctoral dissertation, the amount of economic activity in the local community is relatively low. Usually less than 1% of the final looted price shows up in the local community. So you don't have to, to stop looting, generate millions of dollars of economic activity. It's nice if you can, but normally you're in fairly small communities with exceptionally small daily wages. It's really not necessary to go that far up the scale in order to make this competitive point. So I think it's important as I start to talk about economic development, our goal is not to create multi-million dollar businesses. If that happens to occur, wonderful. The people in the community are great. If we can create the new touristic or sustainable preservation equivalent of Facebook or Twitter, that we'd be exceptionally happy to do so. But the real key is to generate enough economic activity to compete with alternative economic uses. And I say that because right now, archaeology for most communities produces zero economic value, particularly when there's not an excavation going on. Archaeologists come to town, we hire 10 people or 20 people to dig, we dig for two months, we leave the other 10 months of the year. What's the economic activity of the archaeology in general in zero? Conservationists have a slightly different paradigm. They'll go and they'll conserve stone for one year to hire a lot of local people, even train them in stone cutting or stone preservation. And that's great so long as they're there. As soon as the project ends, zero economic activity. And by the way, there's not a whole lot of work other than the preservation organizations for people who are experts in stone restoration. It's not as if there's an ongoing market for that elsewhere. So what you're doing effectively then is creating those, those kind of paradigms is creating an unsustainable model or a model that must be sustained all the time by an outsider. And that's you know, wonderful and it's better than nothing. But our goal is to create things that are truly locally sustainable. Our goal is to get out of town as quickly as possible. It's not as if we're going to come in and leave in the same day, but we hope that within a three to five year period, we have little or no contact other than data collection for our own academic and for the publication reasons with the local businesses. Very similar, and I'll talk about this in a second, to how a venture capital fund uh, uh, works in the US. Um, we try to also think about how can local dollars multiply. Again, if you don't have local economic activity, there is no possibility for a multiplier effect to continue on through your, and this is a great chart from Brent Lane, a uh, business school professor at uh, University of North Carolina. And what it's really showing is if you create one business, that business needs businesses. And if you create another business, that business needs businesses, and the dollars keep circulating, and there's those of you who studied economics, there's a multiplier effect. One dollar can be recirculated five or six times in the community and be income and services to several people in the community. Whereby if you don't do this, if things are on the outside, you have zero multiplier effect within the community. So, and this is a, you know, a flow chart that we put together to kind of talk about sources of funds. Globalization is coming. That means that these communities, which may in the past have been able to remain isolated, do not. It's not as if your choice is do a sustainable preservation project or an archaeology project or remain some pristine and analyzable community living in the past. The biggest threats to archaeological sites and cultural heritage sites is not moving. There's, most of the literature is on moving. The biggest threat is alternative economic development. It's big agriculture. It's big mining. It's big energy, oil and gas. <coughs> and these folks come along and they kind of try to hire as many people as they can in town, create economic activity. They're not terribly interested in preserving cultural heritage sites. On the other hand, a positive of globalization has been that people are now willing to travel to places, go to places, and see things that 20 years ago were not possible. Uh, I just came back from seeing the gorillas in Rwanda, which was amazing, but there were people there from all over the world, all socioeconomic classes, who had somehow figured out how to get themselves into the middle of Africa, 
see gorillas, and get home all in a two-week vacation period. That's extraordinary and it's new and it's a risk because you now have these people wanting to clamber all over archaeological sites, but it's also potential. Is this increase in tourist flow can increase income to local businesses and it can do two things with that money. One, it can help the lives of poor people living around these communities and make no mistake, the vast majority of archaeological sites in the developing world are in poor communities. The model also works in developed communities they just number of zeros gets to be a bit larger. But second of all, it provides a reason and some funding to actually preserve the archaeological site. Why? Because if you, sorry. Why? Because if you don't preserve the site, your business goes away. I would argue that, the, that that is the most powerful reason people have for preserving their past. The classical paradigm or somebody from the first world to go to somebody from the developing world and explain to them how important their heritage site is so that they will preserve it or teach them the cultural history of their site which they may or may not know and may or may not quite frankly care about. Those are, those are far less efficacious methods than economic development. And I would in fact challenge you to find significant numbers of examples where the former paradigm of teaching and explaining has actually worked on a long-term basis past the time an archaeologist worked there to preserve an archaeological site. If you find examples that will fill more than one hand, I would be very, very surprised. So where did the idea for this come from? Um, Richard mentioned that I had a past before becoming an archaeologist. I was uh, CEO and an entrepreneur of several companies and decided to make a career change and was doing my dissertation work at a site called Inca Yacta up here in Bolivia, a beautiful, monumental Inca site, an incredible, incredible spot. My advisor is sitting right there, so you know, I have to be on my best behavior in talking about it, not make any mistakes, but here it is in the center of Bolivia. And you can see this is a beautiful, magnificent site, 12 hectares, that building in the Northeast corner is the biggest single room structure in the New World prior to the arrival of the Spanish. It's 80 meters long, 25 meters wide, it was roofed. We excavated it found the columns. Just incredible amounts of magnificence. And yet we had problems, especially when we weren't excavating there. This was an excellent place, as you can see, to graze your cattle. And grazing cattle in buildings don't really get along. Uh, several parts were planted with uh, corn and potatoes and other crops. Again, not very helpful. And by the way, this tall building, which is about the size of a soccer field, is a really wonderful place to play soccer. The site's at more than 10,000 feet. It keeps your ball from rolling away. Who wants to chase a soccer ball at 10,000 feet of altitude? Well, here you've got, you know, sort of the Inca version of the Astrodome. I guess the Astrodome's not taken down. Whatever the, I don't, know, I don't know what the thing is here in Philadelphia is, but it's a, you know, it's an Inca version of a big indoor arena now. That these, none of these are very good for the sites. People would camp in here for spiritual retreats and you know, dig holes for their barbecues and their hatches and all of these things. And so we tried all of the classic paradigms. I gave some absolutely phenomenal and scintillating lectures on the cultural history of the Inca and the importance of this site. And everyone was like, yes, we have a very important site in town. And we would teach and have classes and I'd say, you know, it's really, it would be really great if you didn't graze here, do your crops here, all those kind of things. Yes, yes, yes. And I'd come back the next day, the next month, the next season, grazing. So I said, wow, I'd like to believe that I'm a more persuasive person than that. And I, of course, you know, immediately put aside the fact that perhaps my lecture was too dull to persuade anyone. And so tried to think about some other paradigms. And what we started doing, there's finally, kind of out of desperation, is there was one road to this site. Now the site is 100 miles from the nearest big city. There's one road into it. And we would get 10 tourists a week, maybe. Half local, half foreign. Now for a foreigner to get out here, you have to first of all got into the city of Cochabamba, Bolivia. You have to rent a car and a guide and drive 100 miles. You've spent some bucks. So I had the idea, let's and we talk to the community. Let's put a gate across this road. We'll let Bolivians in for free, and we'll charge Americans 10 bucks. We had several community meetings, and the, and the upshot of it was no one had, they had not, any more than I had, thought of these as economic assets. And so what I said to them was, 
And they said, no one will pay $10 to see these rocks. And so finally we agreed that I would pay for the gate, and I would pay for a month's worth of wages. And then we would revisit. Uh, that, you know, this is an exceptionally poor area. Per capita income annually, $100. So it's really exceptionally poor. So the gate and the month's wages, I would go on all in for 50 bucks. Uh, there's a great video online if you want to see a long description called Site Preservation for $50. Well, the first week we got four foreign tourists, and the second week we got three, so we raised 70 bucks. We had 140% return in two weeks, and I thought maybe I should go back to the capitalist world if I could achieve those kind of returns. <laughs> but more importantly, the views and perception of people changed. This was an economic asset without destroying the site. It was like, oh, I mean, actually, we could make more money if we grazed elsewhere and didn't play soccer there. So the first thing they did with the money was they bought out the guys who were buying crops, created a new grazing ground, a new soccer field off the site. Then, all of the things in the classic paradigm we then could do, we then trained guides who could make additional money for these people, and you were required to take a guide for an extra, I think it was 5 or $10. We then brought all, because education is still important, and I don't want to, we took all the kids from the zone ages 9 to 16 into the main museum in Coach Obama so we could put this in their culture. But there was no interest in doing that until this site had relevance to their economic well-being today. And you know, when you think about it after the fact, we tear down historic buildings in major cities every day to build new condo towers. Why should we expect people who are starving to death to do better than that? Why shouldn't we expect them? We're not going off with an alternative to loot, graze, grow, destroy, etc. It's, I hate to say it, it's human nature. So, armed with this uh, realization, which probably should have come sooner, but I'm comforted by the fact that someone said to me that all good ideas look obvious after the fact, uh, we moved on to form. I looked around for another organization that was doing this, and there were a couple that reported to, but I couldn't find any that were really doing economic development. And so, decided to form the Sustainable Preservation Initiative. And we fervently believe, and this is what we did in the small scale there, the only way to preserve sites in most places is by creating local jobs and businesses whose success is tied to that preservation. And it provides a two for the price of one. I try not to do my, everybody remember Crazy Eddie? At a certain age, you remember Crazy Eddie? Yeah. Prices were insane. You know, two, two, <laughs> was, two pence and one for certs. Uh, Providing these incredible economic opportunities while at the same time saving and preserving the world and doing it with the same dollars. As you all know, there is very little money for the preservation of cultural heritage in the world. Estimates different, but from non-governmental sources, the number is definitively less than $50 million a year. That is a drop in the bucket. By the way, the amount of money that is spent on economic development in poor communities has a several, several, several billion dollars. What do we do? We try to create and support locally owned businesses. Ones that maximize job creation because the people who have the jobs and the ownership are the ones who are going to fight for the site. If your job is going to disappear, you're going to stop somebody from grazing, growing, or do your best to do that. You won't win all the fights, but at least you've got a political group in the game that cares. It also, when people are earning their living, it strengthens their community identity and their desire to learn more. A, because of the, this is their past and something to be proud of. B, because honestly, the more they know, the more they earn. They can incorporate that in their products, in their tour guiding, and in their interactions <laughs> with their tourists. Next, we try to attract manageable and appropriately scaled tourism. And to me, this is in some ways the most important point. It's the biggest failure of many of the development organizations, the USAIDs of the world, the interdollar in development. They want to build quarter million, half million dollar, million dollar visitor centers everywhere. Even in a community where that's more than the entire community earns for the entire year. And they built them without any thought to how these things are going to be sustained and maintained after they go. It's easy to build a business, to build a building. It's hard to build a sustainable asset. Now, those of you who are in business, you've never built a factory without thinking about what's your market, how are you going to keep your lights on, who are you going to hire, and how are you going to pay them. 
That's what they do. We build these visitor centers, and I can give you a tour of empty visitor centers at archaeological sites. I'm, I'm sure you've all been to one where you see these giant museums, and they've got one little room of exhibits. That's what we're talking about here. Take that money and do 20 small, sustainable projects and let them build. Our view is, let's build one room. When that one room is full with objects and businesses, let's build another room beside it, etc. Same way you would grow a business. And then let's create exceptional experiences. So these are smaller sites. You need ways to get tourists off. That involves letting them interact with the artists. You can actually, at some of our sites, you know, weave alongside our weavers or make ceramics or paint ceramics alongside so that you can have these kinds of exceptional experiences. We're interested in a replicable model. What we want to do is take this model. The world we don't feel needs another charity that's doing one project a year. There's nothing wrong with it, but we want to create a model that everybody can follow. I'm going to talk a little bit of what that takes. So you need to be able to replicate this model at multiple sites and let these things be catalysts of growth. Because that's how you really create a lot of jobs. Two, you need to measure your returns. I'll talk about how we do that. Economic, social, and preservation. <laughs> If you give me enough money, I can save one poor child somewhere in the world, or one poor artisan, or one site. Trust me. But the real question, I think, is per you know, with a million dollars, or with a hundred thousand dollars, how many sites are you preserving? How many jobs are you creating? Charities like to do feel-good kinds of marketing. I like to do feel-good kinds of marketing. However, if you can't, you know, what if your element of success is, has to have to do with, are you maximizing the bang for the buck or not? And we focus on underserved sites. And we like to do it in places where archaeologists have expert knowledge of their community. Those of you who are archaeologists and others know, if you've been working in a poor community for a while, you have a pretty good sense of the social dynamic. You know that everybody there hates Bob. So even if Bob seems like the best promoter, Bob is probably not the guy you ought to be backing in your new sustainable preservation thing if you want to build it from your entire community, buy it from your entire community. So that's all well and good and theoretical, but let me take you through an actual project. This is a cemetery, a famous cemetery on the north coast of Peru called San Jose de Moro. And you can see here our artisans uh, train, in training who are making these beautiful objects. San Jose de Moro is located in northern Peru in Japan. It's a cemetery in which burials were occurring from, for those who know chronology, the late Moche period, roughly 500 to 600 AD, up to the Chamu period, roughly 11 to 1200 AD. And you can see these are actual tomb shots. They're famous for their beautiful ceramics and metalwork, and here gives you a sense of the stratigraphy. I mean, it's enormous. They've hauled out, I believe, 700 burials to date during this project. And they're famous for, one among other things, these incredible fine line ceramics. The ceramics are made from molds and then painted with very thin, most likely animal hair brushes. Really spectacularly beautiful. And the site is in danger. On the left, you can see what the site looked like in 1930. And you can see, just from normal economic activity, and there, is, there has been in the past a lot of living here, the site is shrinking. People are already building on top of the site here in the year uh, this latter picture is roughly the year 2000. So the site is disappearing under the town. It's disappearing from looting, agricultural activity, desire to build water systems, all the kinds of things that normally, as a town, moves from being in the country to being organized. What did we decide to do here? We awarded them a $40,000 grant to build a visitor center, an artisanal studio, to do a guidebook, and to train tour guides. So we started with sustainable construction. This is one of my favorite things. We actually took the screen factor from the excavations and turned it into the adobe bricks that are going to make up the visitor center. So our bricks are using dirt that's, you know, that was part of the cultural matrix that existed in this site a long time ago. We, uh, we can start to construct a visitor center a ceramic workshop, and we start to de we decorate it with the iconography of the area so that there's a real sense of what was going on at the site as you drive by and as you see it on a daily basis. I'm the only person in the world who shows toilets in his talks. <laughs> and the reason is, if you don't have clean toilets, tourists will not stop. Or they will not stop as long. So we have the finest bathrooms for 50 miles around. We like to say,
said, and it's important, and I know it seems silly and doesn't belong in an academic talk, but no toilets, no tourists, no tourists, no economic development. So here you see the visitor center as it's you know, approaching its completion. What do we have in the visitor centers? We have a store where artisans can sell their local artisans can sell their artisans. We have a training center. We have one master potter, oops, sorry, <coughs> yes, who he had worked on the project and got interested in how these are pro these products, how the moche made their ceramics. He actually made a big contribution to the project through trial and error, showing how the moche fire their ceramics and what kind of kilns and what kinds of temperatures. And he's really a, a wonderful master of arts. That's not something that's excavated. That's something he made. And so he, in addition to making and selling things his own, became the teacher for several newly graduate high school graduates, ages kind of 15 to 19. We'd like to start with newer people because they're not yet set in their ways. They're not yet embedded into their doing what their father and their grandfather did before them to teach them how to make these kinds of ceramic replicas. And so we have a studio, we have a display area, we have a snack bar, something to attract tourists. We took, we worked with the town, we painted all the schools and the walls and towns with this incredible moche themed entrance. It's on the Pan American Highway. And yet the site, even though it was 100 yards off, was impossible to find before. Uh, a colleague of mine, who's now the director of archaeology at UCLA, who some of you know and I, we drove over the top of the site three times before we realized we were there. That won't happen anymore, but if you're driving down the Pan American, this gives you a reason to stop there. Uh, here's Julio Ibrolo, who's our lead guy, teaching all of his students ages 15 to 18. Uh, you'll notice, and one of the things we didn't do well in this project, I'll talk about it, no girls in the class. We started with two, and their families made it very, very difficult for them to come. To the point where one thing we tried to do is we tried to, we did guide training. We scheduled guide training during soccer practice, knowing therefore that only girls could, would show up. That worked a little bit better, but still in this community, they were very reluctant to let their young girls have ages 15 to 19 in contact. We tried to correct that in other projects because we feel it's exceptionally important to try to reach women entrepreneurs, A, because the opportunities don't get to them, and B, every single bit of literature you see and every bit of practical experience I have, women make much better and more reliable entrepreneurs than men. Sorry, guys, but it's true. So here you see the students with uh, their first firings. And one of the things that's interesting, not everyone is going to be a great artist. But what they are all learning about is how to be entrepreneurs, the importance of their cultural heritage, its ties to business, and the, and the potential for their own futures. And what it also does when you have people of different quality is it creates uh, differential pricing for people diverse of different social status. So Julio, the lead guy, he now sells pieces for two and three hundred dollars sometimes. That's extraordinary. Julio's revenues from selling pieces the year before we got there were under $300. He's now selling one piece for that. Several of the uh, new people are selling pieces for $50 and $75. Some sell for $5 and $10. So we have, that means, objects for at all different price points, but we also have people who are really making a living from that. So, real metrics, real results. We finished the project within budget in 10 or 11. First year sales, $5,100. Not half bad when you consider they sold. This is the first year. A lot of new businesses would be happy with that. We had one day sale of $2,000 to a high-end tour group. This was great, but it was also bad in a lesson because I don't think our artisans really believed that they were going to get this influx of tourists if we created this experience. It essentially wiped out their inventory. And when the second uh, high-end tour bus came through, they probably bought $150 worth of stuff, because that's all that was left. Important lesson learned, but this is how people learn in business here and everywhere else. Let me tell you, they now have a system set up so they know when high-end buses are coming and they've got some inventory in place. And you can see that because the second year sales doubled to 11000 That's pretty impressive, I think. Uh, and other now sales are beginning to come through. Uh, PUCP, Katolika, Peru's leading university, has now contracted with the ceramicists to make 100 replicas to use as gifts. They now give these as gifts on their campus in Lima. Uh, 
which is 600 kilometers away from this site, to dignitaries. Uh, we created 20 construction jobs. We're now up to 22 permanent jobs. Uh, Felix Salmon, who's a columnist for Reuters, a financial columnist, you know, said these are some of the best job creation numbers he's seen for dollar expenditures. You know, 10 of the students have sold multiple pieces. Some of them have sold hundreds of dollars worth. The artisans retain 80% of what they sell. The other 20% they put into a common fund to buy materials and do upkeep. In other words, to keep their own businesses in. They decide what that percentage was. Originally it was 90, 10. They realized they didn't have enough money for materials and upkeep and they changed over. We prepared brochures and guidebooks and train guides. Here's a bilingual guidebook which you can now buy at the site because the site has no standing visible architecture, but yet you can tour the great facilities. Now, okay, we started with ceramics. Now we have seven local women who are serving traditional lunches to tourists. Last year they generated 2,500 bucks of revenue and a part-time job. This is one of our efforts to try to include more women in the community. This, for some reason, seemed to fit better into the social fabric of the community. Three local women artisans who are making textiles about two months ago just showed up at the site and said, hey, we want to start selling our things here. We said, welcome. We gave them the spot. In their first month, they sold $360. We're going to give them some training because they're textile. They're highly skilled, but what they're making are not the kinds of objects that tourists want to buy. This is what I'll talk about in a second. Is we are working hard with our artisans to train people to make things that tourists want to take home. For example, the ceramic area, those big pots called beautiful, they break pretty easily in your luggage. So we're making, having the artisans make more plates. This plates fit more easily into your bag. You can wrap bubble wrap around them more easily and they don't break. And if they do, they break once and you can crazier to really glue them back together when you get home. Uh, we've also had some economic activity inspired that we had nothing to do with. Two new small snack bars opened up just by seeing the tourists come by. And somebody else opened up another ceramic stand in competition cars. It drives our people nuts. They say, oh, his quality of work is terrible. And I, of course, what he has is terrible. And I'm actually happy because what we're trying to do here, remember the multiplier effect slide, is catalyze economic activity. That's more people who are making a living and more people who care whether this site exists going forward. Um, we've been able to expand sales channels. Uh, Many of the objects that we've produced are now for sale in museums around the country, including the biggest in Lima, the Museo of Art in Lima, several of the regional archaeological museums such as the Bruning, uh, artisanal fairs like this one at Catolica. We're now invited to a lot of these and able to sell objects, which brings exposure to the paradigm, exposure to the sites, revenue to the people. It's really a self-iterating and self-reinforcing process. We sell online now. Selling online, everyone goes, oh, that's easy. Selling online is one of the hardest things for anyone to do in business. If you think about the logistics of transporting the objects from the artisan to a shipping point, packaging them, doing all the tax and customs things, then shipping them overseas and having them get through customs and then show up at an end user, not easy. Nova Go, which is a joint venture between National Geographic and some micro funders, is now selling our objects online. You know, we're not, we, our online sales are probably still less than $1,000 a year, but those logistical issues are still pretty darn daunting. But we, you know, we now get an international exposure, and if you want to send as a holiday gift, Valentine's Day is coming up, you're the one you love, a beautiful ceramic <laughs> a pitch, you can go on to novica.com and find that. Uh, our sites are now being placed on the itineraries of major tour agencies. Lima Tours, which is the biggest tour company in Peru, has in fact adopted San Jose de Moro. They sent 100 people up there to paint schools, the walls of the schools, and paint the schools and do other education programs. We're now in their regular itineraries. Now, not everybody wants to come and see the site, but a certain kind of tourist does. Trust me when I say that Lima Tours had never heard of San Jose de Moro two years ago, but again, when you catalyze economic opportunity and start to create entrepreneurs, working with them, you can generate these kinds of activities and potentials going forward. Okay. Looting and site encroachment have stopped in San Jose de Moro. I showed you the picture from 2010 on the right, 1930. If I took the picture today, it would be the same. Every year, 
we go around and we do essentially a map of the boundaries of the site to see whether or not it's been encroached upon. It has not been in the last three years. And there has not been a single new incidence of looting in the site, which had been in the past heavily looted since we started. Um, that's almost a record that's too good to be true. I can't say that will happen everywhere we work, but not when it is happening. But the point is we're measuring it and we're looking at it. We've also had some indirect benefits. Um, Luis, my kind of Luis Jaime Castillo worked at this site for 20 years and said the only thing he ever got from local government was a hard time. And he did all kinds of, so of the classical social projects. He set up modular museums. He taught classes. He did, gave tours to local dignitaries. None of it mattered. All of a sudden, the local people are viewing their cultural heritage and preserving it as a means of economic development. So the municipality in which we sit is paying for and installing a new entrance and signage on the Pan American Highway, a parking lot, signs, easy to find. The municipality of Japan, which is kind of the equivalent of a state there, paid for 5,000 more guidebooks for use by their tourism board as well as in their classrooms as a way of teaching the past of the region. Unheard of, the mayor of Japan went to a nearby site, which we're not even working at yet, and he ejected people with the police. He ejected some squatters and denounced an incursion and placed security there because he sees the potential for a touristic circuit. Never happened in the history of Japan. Rarely happens in the history of Peru. And it's extraordinary. People are now taking care of their own heritage. Um, Catolica University is now using all sorts of multidisciplinary work with us, focusing on branding, education, and architecture. Their branding classes, the final project now is every time we do a new site, each group of students has to prepare a new branded mark for the artisans at the site, and then we have a competition to pick the winner. I'll show you some of that later. So, you know, again, 20 years of non-involvement, the social aspect of the university is now seeing that they can do all the things that they talked about doing, and it actually works better when it's tied to you. Know, so their branding people are there, their education people, their art people, their architecture people, all are covering, they're putting funding to send these professors and students up to gain experience of the paradigm. This thrills us because it disseminates the paradigm throughout Peru. So at the end of the day, if we can't get others to adopt the paradigm, it can't spread rapidly enough in scale. It needs to be done by them and the government. I should note that Luis Jaime Castillo, who did this for a project, is now Vice Minister for Cultural Patrimony in Peru, in part because they liked his views, which happen to coincide with our views on the ability to use sites non-destructively as economic assets, and not Wood will be signing a convenio with the government clothing to try to be part of their social program to bring this paradigm to a lot more sites. So, summing up, in less than two years, 11,000 bucks, 22 permanent jobs, empowered local entrepreneurs. To me, this is the most important. Whether these businesses long-term fail or succeed, who knows? I think some of them will fail and some will succeed. But you've got people who've got entrepreneurship and some business skills. Now, we're doing some other projects. Pandoria is, this is the site of the oldest monumental architecture uh, in Peru, 5,000 years from old, it's incredible pyramids. It's right on a beautiful environmental center, it's a tour or read area, and so they make these wonderful baskets that you can see. Uh, Chotuna Chonancap is a site in the north of Peru, famous for among other things, textiles. Here we have this incredible cooperative of 12 women weavers, all women, I'm happy to say, who are making these beautiful, beautiful products. And uh, we've just announced that we're going to start working with the monumental site of Pachacama. We think this is a huge development because it reflects how the paradigm is becoming embedded in Peruvian heritage discourse. After Machu Picchu, arguably Pachacamac is the most important archaeological site in Peru. It's famous for its Inca Temple of the Sun, a whole slew of other pyramids that are there. It's occupied for a thousand years, truly monumental. Three communities that have been infringing on it on a regular basis, and we're about to start one of our projects. And this was big news in the press, and we're very, very excited about it. Now, I talked about, you know, that it sounds like everything we've done is perfect. What hasn't been working? One of the big problems is that 
you're working with people who are not trained in basic business skills. And when I say that, I mean not just people in the community who we're working with as entrepreneurs, but archaeologists, anthropologists, and heritage people. Most people don't come to get an advanced degree or a PhD in one of those fields because they have a fabulous interest in managing and starting businesses. In fact, some would argue that going and getting a PhD may be the most foolish economic decision you could possibly make in a capitalist system. We have no training in basic business skills. People, most of the people have never been in the formal tax system. When you can't sell to tourists, you can't take credit cards, you can't sell in museums and do customs duties if you're not part of the formal economy. Uh, as we talked about, if you don't understand inventory and seasonality, you're going to have tour buses show up and not have things to sell. And then you're going to panic when during the tourist low season, nobody comes and buys a product for a month. And oh, by the way, all the money you earned two months ago, you didn't bother to put some of that aside to pay your costs until the tourist season comes back. You know, working capital, marketing, customer service, all of these kind of things. So one of the things we are now in the process of instituting at all of our sites is capacity training for new entrepreneurs, basic business services. We didn't do this to start. We would train people how to make the goods to sell. And we thought that was enough. It's not enough. And I think, you know, we had one project that had real trouble because they didn't have this training, and others could be more successful if they had this kind of training. So this is something that we're bringing to bear. The next thing is, we have a deal, what in the venture capital business, you'd call a deal profile. We get very few applications. And the reason I think we get very few applications is that archaeologists and heritage systems and communities, they don't have the, the skills to do this, and they don't have the incentive. No one has ever gotten tenure by doing a great sustainable preservation project at their site. Sorry, it should be, but community relationships and tenure have no relationship to one another in 99.9% .9 of the universities in the world. And as long as that is true, no matter how well-meaning these folks are, we all know that if your first priority is your teaching, second is your research, the third is your publication, the fourth is that very important committee that you sit on. And the fifth is that other really, really important committee that you sit on. You're rarely going to get to number six because this is time consuming and it's difficult. Many people don't work with strong local partners, which really are very helpful in getting into business. And they don't have the skill sets. You know, it's not like you can just walk into a community, analyze it, and have it. Uh, so one of the things that we're now doing, in addition to giving talks like this, we're starting to, we're going to create a course module, one of a couple weeks or two, which I and hopefully other members of our board will try to teach at different universities to try to give people some basic background in these business skills, how to look for these, what questions to write, and when is the right time to call us. We're also preparing questionnaires to get collect data so that we can perhaps select some people to focus on to do projects with. Um, you know, private equity firms, venture capital firms, they do what's called a screen. They look for certain sets of characteristics and they say, all right, we're going to start by looking at those because they're more likely to be places where we can work. We're going to start trying to do the same thing. We need to be more proactive. Uh, a related problem is finding qualified people with both business, economic, and heritage experience. And one conclusion that I've drawn over three years is that business skills are more important. I have really lost interest in hiring heritage people who don't have the other skill. And the biggest problem is not that they're not smart. The biggest problem is they think that everybody thinks heritage is as important as they do. And I hate to be the one to disillusion. They don't. But they prioritize heritage, heritage, heritage. Uh, you know, we've won a bunch of awards and had amazing economic results at our one of our heritage people in writing our newsletter started out with the people of the community organized a cleanup of their site. And yes, from an anthropological point of view, was that the most interesting thing that happened? Absolutely. Does anyone who's not an anthropologist want to hear about that first, second, or third versus that you're spending their money well, that you're creating jobs, and that you've achieved international recognition and awards? Sorry, no. So, can need people who have some of these business kinds of skills. 
These are some of the big issues we face as an organization to get ourselves to the next level. And you know, what I'm showing you here is very similar to what I presented to the board of directors at SBI in our last meeting. Because right now we're punching way above your car weight. But one thing I do know is you can't always do that. At some point you have to grow up and actually have the weight to keep punching that hard. Thank you all very much for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions.